All right, um, welcome. I'm here today with uh, Kate Compton, better known as Galaxy Kate. Uh, first of all, a little bit of a fanboy moment. I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, so we're just going to be picking your brain a little bit about games and AI and some of the stuff we have been talking here at the, the summer school. So just to get us started, um, what inspired you to get into, into game dev and more the researchy side of game dev? Yeah, um, so my, my origin story is always, uh, I didn't play games as a kid very much. Um, I like I played a little bit of Sonic. I played a fair amount of like King's Questy type of games, um, but I never really like. I'm definitely not a gamer. I still play very few games. Um, I try to play the games that my friends make, and I don't do a very very good job at that. Um, but I always really liked uh, making dioramas and doll houses and stuff. So uh, the way that I always describe how I got into games is I really love making little worlds and inviting people in. Um, so that's always kind of been what I look for in my own games. That's, that's awesome. And um, so given what you're working on these days and some of the conversations we'll be having, what are you most excited about uh, with, the, with the work in games and AI? Yeah, uh, really kind of opening things up a little bit. Uh, so we spent, uh, as you've seen from talks today, we've spent a really long time on like uh, procedural platformer generation. Um, and like, well, that was my, that was, I think, kicked off by my master's thesis back at Georgia Tech in 2006. Um, which then, at, I haven't gotten confirmation of this, but uh, across the street from us um, was, uh, um, they made Robot Unicorn Adventure, uh, and their people were at my poster session, and I can only kind of assume that, like, yeah. that was kind of where a lot of that stuff jumped off, and then I got to see kind of, like, the next, gosh, we're almost, like, on 20 years now of that. Uh, no, not 15 years. Um, and so, yeah, like kind of seeing a lot of these like, oh, we can generate levels, we can generate kind of infinite stuff. And then really, as you saw, kind of getting a little bit towards more inviting people in, um, that there's not there's not a single equation for fun necessarily in the, the same way that there's not, if you make a symphony, there's not the optimal note that you then want to play for two hours uh, or, you know, what's the optimal song in general. Um, it's really, no, there's a, a wonderful space and then get letting, getting people to kind of collaboratively interpret and explore that space with you. I, that's parts that I'm really excited by. Uh, that, that's that's a very good point. And uh, do, you, do you think this more collaborative approach to things like PCG or inviting other perspectives, like how do you think this will impact games and maybe the research as well? Yeah, um, how will this impact games? Uh, I think we're seeing certainly, I don't know if it's more or uh, just because everybody was so much more online during the pandemic, um, these big collaborative communities um, where there's big communities that start around a game, not just, uh, you know, being fans of the game, but kind of building their own content, building their own worlds, um, building their own ways of exploring uh, exploring the games or documenting the games. Um, so that's pretty neat. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm hoping we see more of that. It would also be interesting to see, like, how does how does ownership change? Like how do how can people kind of have more control of, uh, you know, if I make beautiful content exploring a game and the game goes down, um, how can I kind of preserve? And we've seen like a bunch of the academic projects no longer accessible uh, that I tried to see from today's talks. It's like oh, our stuff goes down just so often, and it makes it hard for us to kind of build cities around it. Yeah, we need some sort of like museum or preservation. Yeah effort, right? Um, and yeah, I, th I think what you mentioned around like the, the bigger communities getting getting kind of coalescing around games with like baseball or even uh, mm -hmm. uh, what's uh, the island game? I, uh, Animal Crossing yeah. Horizons. Um, mm -hmm. That also created like a very big... Uh, yeah, it's mostly around Pinterest. Pinterest was like the huge source of that one. So platforms that we would not have expected, you know, gamers to be on. Yeah, definitely. And with, with, with that said, like how do you think, or what do you think the future of AI looks like from, from your perspective, right? Like, what do you see in the horizon? Yeah, um, um, I think it's going to get really weird really fast. I think we're all kind of picturing that right now. Um, right. I definitely was on the side of not thinking that, uh, like, if you had pitched, and actually I had been pitched a while back of the, oh, what if we made, uh, we've got AI, why don't we just, like, predict what the next step in a uh, puzzle game would be? And I was like, that's really... Uh, and then, of course, AI Dungeon 2, several years later, actually made that, like, viable. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of things now become viable. Now we have to figure out how do you make them meaningful or fun. Um, so figuring out, like, oh, what is the, what is the pleasure in this? Um, so you can generate infinite art with mid-journey. Exactly. But, oh, what is the pleasure in it? Well, it turns out actually half of the pleasure is um, sharing things. So I did a little Twitter poll just because I was kind of curious. Um, 
do you prefer when you when you make stuff with Mid Journey? Do you prefer, or do you prefer seeing other people's work, or do you prefer um, posting your own, or like making your own work? And it was really kind of interestingly balanced. Like even among people who can make their own work, they actually kind of liked seeing just the flow from other people. That's that's very interesting. And uh, you, we were talking briefly before before this conversation, and uh, you mentioned that you were against AI. Uh, <laughs> I know that was entirely a joke, but uh, you have been very very good at uh, calling out pitfalls or, or potential, mm -hmm. you know, not dangers like misuse or bad use of some of yeah. these techniques. So, what's what's your take on what pitfalls we should be looking out for? Yeah, I think um, I, I have definitely argued with many of the founders of this. Um, you know, it, we we all support like interesting AI. We all support interesting games. We all support our students making strange things. We have a lot of values in common. Um, I think my issue, because I was such a a, a lot of things, a lot of the people in AI studies came out of being um, stereotypical American gamers in the 1980s. Uh, and so they've got a very specific set of touchstones of this is what a game is, and therefore this is what it is to make AI for games. Um, we saw, like, somebody used the example of the Jeopardy playing Watson bot. None of these AIs work for that. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, if I say, oh, I'm going to make a dynamic difficulty adjustment, and we've got, like, what that means, it doesn't apply even to Jeopardy, which everybody agrees is kind of like a mainstream game. Uh, and then you start to get into like, you know, weirder games like, oh, what is it to solve Animal Crossing? What is it to solve The Sims? What is it to solve, um, you know, Stardew Valley? Like you can, I, I optimize for Stardew Valley, but it, that's kind of not the point of the game. Like the point of Stardew is to just like kind of chill and watch your crops go. Uh, so we don't actually have really good ways or like, with the with perpetually chasing Mario and perpetually chasing kind of these these games of a particular person's youth, um, we do end up neglecting all the things that uh, AI could be doing for other types of games that those people didn't play. That that's an amazing answer. Thank you so much. I just just to close out, and I think you you will probably have some some very interesting uh, advice here. Um, as we saw on Monday, there's there's a strong skew on the audience towards students and younger people. Mm -hmm. So there's there's probably like the next generation of game AI practitioners sitting right here, right? Uh, if you had one advice for them, or you know, like a main advice, what would that be? Yeah, uh, make ten thousand things quickly. Um, so there's there's a, an apocryphal example from creativity studies that is a Potter who is instructing their students and split the class into two groups and said, "All right, one group, I'm going to grade you on your single greatest pot." Um, and the other group, I'm going to grade you on how many pots you made. And so the, the first group uh, tried to design their magnum opus pot and fussed and fussed and fussed and like was precise. And the other group said, OK, throw a pot, throw a pot, throw a pot, throw a pot. I've actually been practicing this because I learned pottery this summer. And so I'm up to like 40 pots now. Uh, and they're getting better. Uh, and the, the apocryphal story is that the people who made more pots ended up being better because they so quickly explored the space. And we see this a lot with students, where you'll get a student who has um, often based on the games that they're most familiar with, their idea of the perfect game, they've already written the game design Bible, their idea of game design is to then like add more pages to the Bible, and then eventually like create their magnum opus. And you know, as you get into games, you realize that like games change as you make them. So that kind of embodied cognition is like, once you start making the game, the game has opinions about the game that you're making. And this is extremely the case with generativity, where generators don't often want to make the thing that you thought they were going to make, but they want to make something strange and beautiful instead and so you can either like suppress what they want to make and try to get them back on track or you can if you have a flexibility you can pivot and then often kind of like go with the flow of what it wanted to make but yeah if you can make small things just honestly um casual creators are often more useful than games in this case because you don't have to worry about like oh is this balanced or anything so you just make you take an algorithm and you put a tiny amount of interactivity on it and a tiny amount of output on it and you just have a little fidget toy that's great, you did that algorithm, do it with another algorithm and another algorithm and another algorithm and you like learn all of your tools. So that's that's the fastest way to skill up rather than trying to make the magnum opus. All right, so make a ton of little crazy things. That's the that's advice, I, I agree Lots with that. Lots of garbage awesome. as fast as you can. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you so much for your time, Kate, and uh, we'll be seeing you around uh, this week. Thank you for your talk this morning and yeah. All right, thank you so much.